Okay, everything is good. Good morning, everyone. I am uh, Adrian Solomon. I'm the Deputy Director of the Southeast European Research Center, and I would like to welcome you to the first parallel session of uh, today's Fit for RRI online conference. It's a session on paving the way to institutional change via a quadruple helix RRI embedment methodology. Just to give you an overview of uh, what we will go through this hour, we will have a very brief introduction done by me on the Fit for RRI co-creation methodology, followed by uh, actual showcases of applied RRI experiments, a bit of discussion on some comparative observation of the experiments that we had in Fit for RRI, and then at the end of the session, we will open the floor for questions and answers from everyone. So if possible, try to pin down all the questions, all the idea, all the discussions that you may have throughout all these presentations that will be done by various people, as you will see now. Now, because we talk about the experiment and institutional change and all these things, I would like to just briefly provide an overview on what do we mean by experiment in Fit for RRI. And specifically for this, a Fit for RRI experiment, as you can see here on the slide, is the actual action of engaging quadruple helix stakeholders in an observation and co-creation in an ongoing research towards identifying ways that this quadruple helix co-creation would enable RRI and open science embedment in the, in the ongoing research and of course in the organizations that take part in uh, this project. So basically, this is in a nutshell the idea of the experiment that uh, we had in Fit for RRI. And the goals basically of these experiments, as you may have seen if you took part in the previous days, but just as a reminder, was primarily to foster the uh, RRI and open science adoptions by institutions to build up skills that will facilitate the better implementation of RRI and open science. And ultimately, of course, the end goal is to actually trigger and foster institutional change based on RRI and open science. And all this was done by following a structured approach, a unified methodology, let's call it, that you can see here uh, on the slide. And all the four experiments that have been organized in Fit for RRI followed this approach in order to make sure that we can have comparable results and results that can actually lead to practical and policy implementations. So this specific methodology started with an appraisal stage in the sense that each experiment organizer was asked to map its internal and external stakeholders, quadruple helix stakeholders for the external part, and to identify, for example, their interests, motivations, expected outcomes from adopting RRI and open science. And of course, to select the most important RRI pillars to focus on, as each experiment was usually selecting two or three RRI pillars from the five, six that are available together with the open science concept in order to ensure that the experiments will have an applied and more tailored, let's say, approach rather than adopting all the actual pillars. But as you will see, in the comparative uh, analysis side, overall, all the RRI pillars have been adopted throughout these experiments. Afterwards, a design stage followed when, together with the internal and st external stakeholders, the experiment organizers jointly developed the objectives or reassessed the objectives of the ongoing or the new research projects that they were doing the experimentation upon in order to facilitate this quadruple helix uh, collaboration. Afterwards, the implementation stage took place, meaning uh, the actual uh, per performing the actual research related to the research project or the initiatives that you will see uh, slowly in the case studies that we will have uh, displayed, in the sense that they re-managed and they reassessed the way that research is being done in order to do it jointly with the internal and external stakeholders that were identified. And of course, afterwards, after the implementation phase, a follow-up phase was done in order to wrap up the lessons learned, what can be done next, what, what measures can be taken in order to institutionalize the best practices. Throughout all this experimentation, of course, in order to facilitate learning across the experiments, a mutual learning stage was done through which all the partners and all the experiment organizers were actually exchanging best practices. And at the end, we utilize specialized key performance indicators in order to assess the success and, of course, the effectiveness of each experiment. 
And some of these indicators that you can see briefly here, the quantitative ones, for example, the representation of the entire quadruple helix uh, ecosystem, interest in RRI of each internal and external actor at the beginning and at the end of the experiment in order to see if their interest was raised, similarly for the awareness and the perceived usefulness of RRI to understand if actually these experiments produced a positive impact in the desire of these actors to adopt RRI and open science, and more quantitative ones such as the actual numbers of stakeholders involved, the pillars, the quadruple helix consensus solutions, and so on and so forth, that you will see more in an applied manner from the three exemplification of the experiment. And of course, we had also qualitative indicators in the sense that we try to observe in these efforts to implement RRI and open science in ongoing or new research projects, what policy, policy change recommendations appeared, what organizational change recommendations are required in order to properly foster RRI and open science. If we received any collaboration proposal from outside, from interested parties, yes, they, yes we really enjoyed it. We want to be involved in more RRI-related uh, initiatives and of course especially we paid a very big attention to proposals received from outside society when it comes to collaboration with, with, uh, with uh, researchers and of course we looked into how uh, this best practice multiplication of RRI and open science adoption has been done at the entire quadruple helix ecosystem. So in a nutshell, this is the approach that we took in order to facilitate the, orga the organization of these experiments. And now, without uh, any further ado, I would like to invite the first uh, experiment organizer in order, to, in order to share with us, and I'm sharing again the order of the presentations, in order to share with us up to 10 minute uh, presentation long, their experience and their outcomes from their experiment. So Raquel, I will stop sharing now, if possible, please, to share your screen. Yes. Hello, everyone. I will now start to share my screen. You see? Yes? Yes. Okay. So I will talk about experiment one. Yes. Um, um, I will start by telling about uh, who we are, what our goals in the Fit for RI experiment were, our main challenges, lessons learned, good practices, and plans to further embed RRI in our work. First of all, who are we? We are a private company um, uh, in Portugal, a uh, big company um, with a lot of uh, accredited laboratories and working around the world. Uh, this to give a, 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 clear, a, a, a better idea of who we are. Uh, so the original goals of our experience were to anchor uh, the experiment in a co-experience model to an ongoing project in the energy field, which is a field in which we are very active in research and development of innovation, uh, and to also test previous outputs of the project on governance settings and sectoral uh, variability with respect to RRI. Uh, the project that we uh, uh, anchored the, the, the experiment at the beginning was this project Moebius, which was about modeling optimization of energy efficiency in buildings for urban sustainability. But along the way, we decided to have a new goal, which was to build our own ISQ RRI model. Uh, and what was and how, why, well, I will tell you about how it was. Well, the main challenges uh, right at the start were that uh, when Fit for RRI project began, uh, RRI was a concept that was completely unknown to ISQ. So we are a big company. We are very active in uh, the research and development of innovation, very active in several um, R&D uh, projects, European projects, in several different areas, we are a house of engineering, but we never had heard about RRI before. So of course, this was a big challenge from the start. So uh, 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 along with it came the learning step, of course, because for us to implement an experiment on, on RRI, we had to know what RRI was. So, so the second main challenge that I can point is the learning step, which was a very, very heavy uh, step, but very, very interesting. 
So to understand what lies beneath the concept of RI and open science. Um, the third main, main challenge for us was to get all ISQ researchers on board. We uh, are a big company with about 1,400 uh, employees, but from them, from this number, only, uh, we are only about 50 researchers, but we wanted to get everyone on board. So this was again our, this is also one of the main challenges for us. So the first thing we did in our experiment was to start involving the people. So after a first initial uh, diagnosis, uh, then with some key people in the, in the R&D activity uh, in ISQ, we started promoting these, uh, these events, internal events, for us to start uh, reflecting together, all the team of researchers, reflecting together uh, about what uh, we are doing, what is the, the impact of the research that we develop, so not mentioning right at the first the, 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 the term RRI. And then at some point of the events, we would then summarize what the, the concept is about in 10 minutes. And that was one of the challenges as well. Um, and then after presenting the concept of RRI, we would start brainstorming and talking and reflecting together about uh, uh, what we are doing and, uh, and how it was. Of course, uh, we organized uh, after this first uh, 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 joint reflection sections, sessions, uh, we started a training, a training uh, program, let's say, our training actions. Uh, and for that, we counted on some experts that were also involved in the project. For instance, as uh, University of Mino, they are uh, experts in open science. So we uh, promoted several training actions about what is this of the components? What is this of science education? What is this open, open science, open access? Uh, so several uh, events were uh, promoted then. Um, and again, we tried to involve all researchers, and that's a big challenge. Uh, meanwhile, during the, the project duration, a new ISQ R&D uh, department uh, was created because we had these units, uh, individual units of uh, research that were spread around the company, working together with the operating areas. Uh, but uh, then we decided that it would be better, so the company decided that it would be better to put every researcher together. So uh, the, 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 the research department was created during the experiment. And one of the, 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 the advantages we had was that, well, the new director of the department used to be one of the people involved in the Moebius project, so the, the one from the beginning of the project. So he was more or less aware, and after participating in all, in all the, the sessions that we, we organized, he was quite aware of what we were doing and what this concept was about. And so he was very keen of uh, embedding RRI in the new department division, uh, vision and mission. And this was, of course, an, an advantage for the, the success of our experience. What did we learn with this uh, very briefly? Uh, so we learned that uh, the joint, session, re joint reflection sessions were key to get everyone, uh, get everyone involved. These, these are really interesting, important because if we want to implement an institutional change, of course, everyone needs to be on board, especially everyone when we are talking about re responsible research and innovation, everyone that deals with res uh, research and innovation. So we, we, uh, we think that this was key to, to promote these joint reflection sessions um, with everyone. Then another lesson learned is that researchers, uh, during these sessions, re researchers were faced with issues and ideas that are not usually on the table in their professional lives and work routines. And again, I want to stress that we are a private company. So yes, everyone in, 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 in other uh, uh, companies or in other type of organizations like universities, and I know the, ma the majority of the audience is coming from the academic uh, part of the quadruple helix. Uh, but uh, yes, people don't talk that much to each other. We, we are so always so busy in our business, in our activities that we may, most of the times or sometimes, well, in, in our case, a lot of the times, people didn't talk to each other. So there was no space for this reflection and discussions and 
what are we doing? Where are we going? This kind of philosophical uh, discussions. And, and this was a, an opportunity for people to, to talk and exchange ideas about they, what they were doing inside the, the same company and inside the same uh, activity of the company. So yes, and uh, when faced with some of the questions that we uh, launched for discussion, of course, the researchers were faced with uh, some issues that uh, they don't think about in their normal day. Yes, the tailor-made training sessions constituted an important awareness raising action and uh, being a company and uh, having all the resources that yesterday we, talk a lot, uh, that we talked a lot uh, about from the Foster portal and from the Fit for RRI platform together well, with all the resources being a company we felt the need to tailor uh, our sessions and tailor our contents in most of the cases because we found that some uh, some of the resources that are available are very tailored for an academic or an university uh, context sorry um, yes, going. And uh, another lesson learned is that RRI is a flexible model, not uh, one size fits all. And this is very, very important if we are talking about uh, implementing RRI in a company at least. Because for, R for RRI to be implemented in a company, it has to be to have proven uh, benefits. Well, good practices, and I know that my time is almost over. Good practices. So this, the selection of the components that we would give priority to was then based on the concerns that were uh, um, the concern of the researchers. So the concerns that we heard that the researchers had while promoting these uh, joint reflection sessions. Also, yes, that uh, yeah, tailor-made training sessions on the selected components to accommodate the organization's need. This is very important. And uh, also to plant the seed, because yes, we, we really think this is about uh, planting the seed. There is no immediate change that we can see in mindsets and everything. So this, is, this has to be a long-term uh, work. Um, yes, and plans for us to embed RRI in our work. So we are building our own RRI implementation roadmap. We want to engage more with the society because given the turn of the, 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 the experiment, uh, we ended up not having so much time to do everything we wanted. So, uh, yeah, the, the society part of the quadruple helix, we didn't get there that much. Uh, yes, to set and measure ISQRI model implementation indicators, maybe also aligned uh, with the MOHI, MOHI uh, indicators. Continue this RRI training, make it in corpus sorry for each new researcher and to spread the words. Thank you. <laughs> to spread the word. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raquel, for this excellent presentation. I believe it was very spot on and it really shows the substance that uh, the Fit for RRI experiments have achieved. And this is a true impact case study. So congratulations for this. Now, since you have to leave, I open the floor for questions now. I just, I'm breaking the rules for just for you. <laughs> and I will just allow five minute window for questions. I have already received in private a message with a question that I will ask now, but in case anyone else is, can think of any questions, just after Raquel answers this first question, please feel free either to type it in the chat or to ask. Now, just the first question and then we go to uh, Giovanni. Now, the first question, uh, since you are, of course, you, you're a business, of course, like, okay, I, I know you don't like to call yourself industry, but you are business. <laughs> see any clear link between RRI and return on investment or how does it uh, support the organization on the long term let's say with uh, any return on investment strategy well looking at it from a business perspective of course the, the anticipation part or dimension of RRI and uh, meeting the expectations of society of course this is if we look at from a business perspective this is working for the market so of course I think I see in my perspective this, this is perfectly aligned with uh, doing what the business wants to do. So, yeah, I, don't, I, 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 see, I see it as a, an advantage. Of course, it takes a lot of work and the time to, to put this mindset because, of, of course, we want to meet the expectations of society and not harm society and not harm our world, right? And sometimes uh, the expectations of society are good products that the market wants are not exactly good for uh, the society itself. But uh, yeah, I think it's perfectly uh, possible to align both. Yeah. 
Excellent. Super. Thank you. Now, I think uh, Giovanni wanted to say something. I'm not sure. Is it still the case? Giovanni, yeah. Uh, please unmute. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you very Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I would like you, if possible, to um, articulate, spell out a little more uh, uh, what can count as a proven advantage uh, of RRI for a company. So it's, it's a bit <laughs> on the same line of uh, Adrian's previous question. So uh, what are the, the things that are uh, perceived as a, as a meaningful advantage for a company? I, I would say that uh, it's something that is good for business, <laughs> putting it in, a simple, in simple words, of course. And what is good for business? It's good for business that uh, researchers feel that they are doing something meaningful, for instance. And uh, of course, this goes, goes in line with RRI, if we think of it, in all the, the depthness of each component and the whole, uh, uh, the whole dimension of the, the, the concept, I think. And also, as I said to Adrian, as I told to Adrian, um, uh, seeing, seeing that the innovation that we work for in fact, are ex is expected uh, from by society, so by the market, and this, of course, is good for business. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I I have been working uh, with some other organizations because I I I, I was I really I'm a converted person. <laughs> Uh, in our arrival yesterday, we were talking about the, the converted ones. I'm a, a converted one, of course. Uh, so I have been spreading the word uh, in other companies from into the engineering field and also in other other universities. Um, and uh, sometimes um, companies uh, see it as a, a marketing advantage. But I think this is the first uh, the first view before getting in depth uh, uh, about on what RRI is about and what are the, the, the dimensions of RRI, I think. I don't know if I answered your question. Okay. Proven advantage, good for business. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now there's a question from Gordon. Please go ahead, unmute. Yes. Hello, um, my name is Gordon Dalton. I'm the coordinator of the Ring and Grip projects. Um, the Ring project is a global project in ORI, and we had a work package that is dedicated to the competitive advantage of adopting ORI. Um, there was a global survey conducted with interviews, and the deliverable is now available under work package five under the Ring project, um, where both the financial, the branding, and the marketing value of adopting ORI mostly to industry has been explored. Um, the second, the GRIP project then is like GRIP ORI, it's, it's going to implement uh, we have five case studies in the marine and maritime where we're um, put it, creating action plans for the five case studies. But we're, we, we like to think that we're going, you know, sort of all the way, where we're, we're creating, we're implementing change management and a very large number of interventions. So, of course, training is one intervention, but successful changing of strategies and change management, permanent strategies, then is, is how we're going to measure our benchmark on how successful we are. So, uh, I was interested to hear that you didn't succeed in engaging with quadruple helix. And I'm wondering how successful did you get top management buy in for institutional change? Well, thank you for your question and for your hints. I, I got very interested in, in your hints, so it was very useful. Thank you. I will check this specially ring uh, project uh, deliverable <laughs> from Word Package 5. It will be useful for me and for the work I mean, I'm doing with other, other companies uh, and, uh, or other organizations that uh, are starting to work with RRI. Uh, your second question. Um, as to your second question, well, how can I say? It, there's a momentum. I think sometimes for change to happen, there's a momentum. And there was a good momentum uh, during the, the Fit for RRI project for our uh, change, for our institutional change, which was the momentum of 
creating a new department and aggregating all research activity that was done, being done uh, in the company for years, of course. Uh, so that momentum uh, was a good momentum that uh, facilitated uh, to get the top level management, uh, top ma management level uh, support. But of course, there's the momentum. And uh, I have to admit that with this COVID, uh, COVID situation, um, I believe that uh, it got a little bit suspended. And I, I hope that it's something that has to do with this complex situation that we are living. I haven't been in the office since the 11th of March, uh, although some colleagues are, but I, I haven't. And, and, I'm, and it, for the strategy that we planned and that we designed, it's not exactly the same um, to be together with everyone. And, uh, and of course, we are dealing with exceptional uh, situations. So I hope that once everything goes back to, to normal, uh, we can uh, continue and still count on top level, top management level support. I believe we will, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Raquel. This was very, very informative. Now, just to be cautious with the time, I would like to proceed, so thank you very much. Any further questions, of course, we can take by email or in the chat and we can facilitate uh, its answer later on. Uh, I would like now to invite Andrea Ricci. Hi, good morning to everybody. I'm start sharing my screen. Here we are. Okay, it should be in presentation mode. So, I'll try to be quick to save some time for the questions. Here it is what we did in Sapienza for our co-creation experiment. First of all, our challenge. We aimed at establishing the and which were our aims. The idea was it implementing through an ongoing Sapienza project named Sapirinco, a responsible governance framework capable of strengthening the university capacity for generating social impact and value. And of course, we want to convey some specific message to this uh, experiment among the sustainability, because our main assumption that we are trying keeping nowadays, also in our policies at Sapienza, is that responsibility should be seen as a proper and effective governance dimension to be considered in the management of organization together with the most traditional one that are namely efficiency, efficacy, and cost effectiveness. So more concretely, which were our objectives? First of all, as we are a very complex organization, like 100,000, more than 100,000 students and 4,000 researchers and so forth, to test in a pilot scale, a multi-actor co-created responsible governance in a complex environment. In order to uh, like see in a small context limits and opportunities for a big organization as Sapienza. To involve different stakeholders, also based on a quadruple helix approach in an open debate about responsible research and open science, focusing also on sustainability, circular economy, and biomaterials, with the attempt of shaping a common agenda to engage families and children in order to uh, support them in experience through hands-on experiments, the role of sustainability in their daily lives. As a result, we select some pillars to run the experiments. As you can easily imagine, the main pillar of Bararai was governance because we were working in implementing a governance framework. But we also considered two other pillars that are those of science education and public engagement. So mixing the idea of having like an internal governance framework, even if supported by stakeholders, together with a completely external dimension of science education and public engagement, to engagement towards our community. Well, let's start seeing how we worked for the governance perspective, which was the most complex one for sure. First of all, we put together about 15 internal and external stakeholders. So uh, representatives from the industry world, from policymaking, from civil society, together with our researcher. And we asked them to work in a co-creation, according to a co-creation approach, to design the elements of a desired, at least desired, RRI-based research center. And we used the theory of change by Carol Wise, 
So they has, we ask them to work according a logic framework with inputs, activities, and as I don't know who was there yesterday for the keynotes, trying to differentiate, as Kemal said, in the complicated relationship between outputs, so the immediate results of your action, then outcomes can impact the really measure the real change you can have in your organization. So the results were encouraging, even if not absolutely clear. By the way, we were able to like come out with some outcomes that were for sure that the setup of a responsible governance in research funding and performing organization needs that scientific matters are informed by RRI. For example, uh, touching teams such as research integrity, gender balance, open science and open access. In addition, it was important that all the stakeholders were sure that responsible governance in research organization is by definition open to society and to external stakeholders in a logic of continuous feedback. Uh, another important thing was the need of establishment of a common language, platform and procedures, because, well, they perceived the, between, for example, the public and the private world, for, uh, the, pri the private world, but also between hard science and soft science, some differences in languages, because some, sometimes we also address it as somehow implicit dimension of our right, especially in the uh, teams of art sciences. And again, uh, the most important things, which is sometimes, which is somehow linked to the previous one, is that to implement real institutional change, uh, there was the need to bridge profit and non-profit research and innovation actions, because that usually characterizes some matters. And in addition, responsible governance should be based on a shared set of values that should have been reflected, and we're working on that, uh, on guidelines with proper indicators and aimed at stressing the social value of research and innovation. So based on these feedbacks, some months later, in April 2019, we tried to formalize our governance perspective in order to make more feasible a concrete implementation of our responsible governance. And again, we had to choose our tool of work because they were the same people that we had in the previous meeting, so internal and external stakeholder. And in this case, we decided to, uh, to work through the balanced scorecard. So trying to define uh, main objectives and then sub-objectives, uh, indicators and action with related targets, uh, uh, aimed at focusing on the implementation of a responsible governance according to four main dimensions. The financial dimension, which is also, uh, I would say, resources dimension. So also in terms of human capital or uh, infrastructures that you already have, then the user's perspective, so uh, the external perspective, but also then focusing on uh, the internal processes, so how we can change our internal processes, and then a perspective of growth and innovation. How can we um, improve our work and how can we uh, innovate? through responsibility. The formal results was this balanced scorecard with a general objective, which is implement our right based research center, and the sub-objective for each of the four dimensions cited before. And this was further implemented. We will not go in detail on each of these tables, then you will see them, but you can, of course, have access to this slide, through tables based on indicators, target, and action for each dimension. Just to see uh, an example here, in terms of like financial perspective, we say realize an investment on responsible and sustainable actual action. And this was like linked with three indicators with a proper target and with a set of related actions as well. So I will go quickly on this. Then now we can move to the education and engagement perspective that took place in May 2019. In order to cope with the idea of working on science innovation and public engagement within this research center named Sapir and Co, we organized two hands-on workshops for kids and their family. And these workshops were linked with other public engagement initiatives already in place in Sapienza that uh, deals with the opening of our like university museum during the month of May. 
The two workshops were dedicated to sustainability and more in detail to bioplastics preparation with daily ingredients. So for example, organic waste or coconut flour and to the creation of superheroes but with, uh, with 3D printers using organic materials. Uh, what we wanted to achieve also, apart from giving the idea that sustainability uh, it's in our daily life, uh, was the idea that uh, science education and public engagement represents a responsible action itself that show how world and as aspects are connected to all our right pillars. And here you have like some pictures, that's the bioplastics and the kids preparing bioplastics. And these are our sapphire heroes and the kids working on their sapphire heroes. As far as it concerns our quadruple helix approach, we can say that cooperation among stakeholders was surely favored by the experiments then because Sapirinko was funded to be an interdisciplinary multi actor hub devoted to procreation and cross fertilization. By the way, there is a common difficulty that is grounded in the academia in establishing a quadruple helix approach because somehow the university system, at least in our national context, is still reluctant to some forms of cross fertilization. And there is not a proper national strategy or an incentive structure to foster and favor it. Institutional change. Well, we used a teaser, which is not exactly the one that we are talking about, so our array of open science, but we used third mission, which is somehow a trending topic now in university. And that means uh, uh, the capability of the academy of implementing trusted, mutual, and socially fruitful science and society relation. And in this way, by using like the anchor of third mission, we were able to start a process lay the groundwork for some degree of institutional change. But the real outcome that we are trying to achieve is make researchers aware that responsibility and openness are not administrative issues to tackle, but they represent another value in their daily research work. Well, for doing so, this, some policy support is required, at least internally, and we started working on this, creating a working group both with research and administrative staff uh, in order to work together in the definition of indicators for the third mission. And we also launched a successful internal corporate funding for implementing science and society relation. And well, we had some slowing due to COVID-19, but we have like 20, more than 20 projects approved and we are like going to see how they will work in this. Next goal, keep working on responsible governance keeping this collaborative approach as well. Implement engagement and science education activities within Sapirin Co and even within the entire university on a regular basis, trying to involve not only civil society, but also other quadruple helix actors, and trying to connect these experiments with other ongoing initiatives. In this case, we are working, creating a connection with we did with CV's project, which was the one funded under the European University's call, Erasmus call, where we're establishing open labs for co-creation. That's it. Thank you. I hope that Thank you very time. much, Andrea. This was very, very good. Uh, as I wrote down in the chat, we will uh, keep the Q&A session at the end, just to better manage the time. Therefore, if write down on, you know, digital your questions, just not forget them. And I would like to invite Nancy, if possible, to share her experiment. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So I'm going to start setting my monitor now. Does this work all right? Um, I personally, I cannot see, but I'm not sure if... Okay. Let Works, me... Nancy. Okay. It's okay. Uh, presentation. Okay. 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 So I am here to present the use case from uh, the Open University. And what we did at the Open University is that uh, we took a little bit of a uh, different uh, direction. So we did not um, plan um, a use case study which uh, had, which uh, related to responsible research and innovation and open science and the application of it. But we, our topic was a little bit different. It talked about text and data mining of big scholarly data but we tried to do the whole process in uh, an RRI way. And uh, this was the first time for us. And uh, we learned uh, a lot of um, um, uh, new information with uh, the guidance of uh, 
the project partners and uh, we also have drawn uh, very many important uh, and useful conclusions that we plan to apply in any future uh, project that we are going to run. So in reality, the problem that we were trying to solve is the fact that uh, right now there are, uh, there are a lot of outputs out there um, that um, students and uh, researchers are able to access via the university subscriptions. But this access is only for people's eyes to read and it's not for machine to machine communication. And uh, the latter point is the one that prohibits uh, text and data mining. So uh, we wanted to see how we could text and data mine content and it's not only open access because right now there is a, a large uh, corpus of open access uh, content available uh, on uh, the internet but at the same time we wanted to take advantage of a recent uh, UK change in the copyright law which uh, enables um, uh, people to perform text and data mining for uh, non-commercial purposes. So we wanted to see how this could be made possible via this uh, research uh, study. Uh, we gave uh, our uh, research uh, project a name and we called this CDUTDM because we got inspired from uh, EduRome and uh, uh, I suppose that the vast majority of you know that EduRome is uh, just uh, an internet connection where someone who is affiliated with the university, no matter where they go, whether their affiliation is in the UK but they visit another university in Italy or in Spain or some other place, they can get access to the internet. So that way uh, we envisioned uh, that uh, the UTDM would work for uh, machine to machine access for content that it's not only open access but uh, via different uh, uh, work, it would be made uh, available to those who want to perform text and data mining. Um, this was a very difficult uh, task uh, to begin with, and uh, we did not know the outcome of these results. And uh, therefore, what we wanted to do is that we wanted to create a group to discuss the idea around it, and uh, develop a conceptual solution uh, where um, this uh, group that this working group that we created would uh, agree upon so we wanted to have um, a lot of uh, stakeholders from uh, various places understanding the main concept of uh, this idea and then seeing how this idea could be made possible the outcome of this is a white paper, the link of which is uh, included in this uh, slide. And um, one of the problems that we met, and you will also see that uh, of the white paper, is that uh, we did not uh, cover some ideas that were difficult to solve and discuss during uh, this uh, short period uh, that this uh, case study was uh, about to like for the timeline of this study therefore we did not intentionally cover the ownership the development and the management of the tool we just wanted to see in general as an idea what kind of um, attention this is going to receive how people are going to see it, whether they're going to have a positive or a negative response. And uh, we wanted uh, just to bring uh, more attention to the matter rather than uh, discuss uh, important uh, things such, such as ownership and development and management. But uh, those are were questions that we could not solve at the moment and required uh, further discussions. So to get a little bit more in detail, we created a working group which had uh, members from the vast, uh, from a wide variety of stakeholders. And uh, examples are the publishers' systems, for example, experts on text and data mining, policy makers, um, other organizations that were uh, in a position to create recommendations and spread good practices, and uh, the industry. Of course, we understand that even though we wanted to include the many uh, stakeholders in the group, we left others outside. The reason that we did that, it's not because we did not uh, foresee that their contribution was needed, but, but uh, again, this was a limitation in the study because we wanted to do this, we had to do this within a time frame 
that, and we had to be um, reasonable and pragmatic as to what we could uh, uh, end up uh, having in the end. Uh, therefore, uh, what, for example, we did not uh, involve uh, the plain users or we did not involve uh, any researchers from um, a UK academic institution and we don't uh, involve any researchers from a non-UK academic institution so that we know approximately what is this uh, that uh, may be uh, common or not uh, or uncommon between their um, responses and way of thinking and uh, needs. But uh, nonetheless, we tried to be uh, to have a wide variety of uh, experts, um, for example, in the publisher systems, to see whether there are changes between those uh, publishers who offer uh, closed access um, to, uh, articles only, or hybrid uh, publishers and open access publishers, for example. So what we did with uh, this uh, working group is that we had uh, six uh, sessions and then we had uh, created a um, mailing list where we exchange also a series of emails. So the white paper was the outcome of uh, these uh, six uh, uh, sessions and uh, the email uh, exchanging. Um, everyone had to agree on uh, everything that we concluded and we wrote down at the uh, white paper in the end. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, we focused most on the technical challenges and uh, as I said earlier, not so much on the organizational challenges. So, for example, what it was, um, the conclusion of our investigation was with regards to the technical challenges, that there is a lack of the common standards or adoption of standards to make this uh, idea happen. And uh, that publishers uh, use a variety of formats. And uh, of course, there are issues with regards to the system's interoperability used between uh, the publishers platforms and all university platforms and all uh, tools that are being used by text and data miners and what is this that um, for example um, organizations that uh, promote um, openness and uh, relate to recommendations and best practices would like to promote and then with regards to the organizational challenges even though we did not touch on them and we did not dig deeper deeper into them, we identified that there were issues such as ownership and uh, incentives, especially for publishers who would, like, who would have to change and amend things, and um, the cost, of course, and then who is going to, uh, what kind of agreements are going to be with regards to standards, formats, how is this going, uh, tool is this going to be delivered, and um, what are the risks, uh, and uh, who in reality is going to get benefited from that, and uh, what about those who don't see the actual clear benefit right then, in, uh, right at that time in front of them? Um, and then to proceed a little bit further with regards to the technical uh, section, we created um, a survey to establish the position of the stakeholders where we asked them a variety of uh, questions uh, that related more to their needs and uh, what kind of um, uh, TDM uh, queries they may be running or how do they see themselves using this service. And then we created a requirement analysis where we created stories for users and stories for publishers. So we took um, some hypotheses and we said that uh, as a, a researcher, I would like to be able to do the X thing from a publisher uh, system, for example and uh, to collect full uh, text or to collect a data set or to um, uh, get uh, this type of information. And uh, with this information, I would like to be able to do an analysis on uh, the X topic. And then while looking at the users, we also looked also at the publisher's point of view. And then we also asked the publishers what is this that they would like uh, to see from uh, this tool and then what they came back to us saying is that they would uh, like to be able to evaluate uh, the usage of uh, this uh, tool and they would like to know who uh, had access to the tool and what kind of information 
uh, this uh, person um, uh, got from the tool. So it was more about knowing their audience and their customers and how the information is being used so that they can uh, monitor it and they can uh, use it uh, for uh, their uh, future needs as a publishing house. And then uh, we developed um, a, a conceptual design which is uh, presented here. And in reality, to make it very simple, uh, this um, graph over here, it uh, has uh, a user which, who uh, does a, a, a call on the API of uh, the, um, the UTDM tool. And then it requests uh, some content from a publisher. And when, uh, then what the tool is doing is that it goes to a variety of publisher and it tries to bring uh, to the user back the results that the user is asking. And then um, in hidden behind this uh, user action, there are some uh, extra um, uh, actions, such as the authentication of uh, the user, the authorization, uh, the aggregation of the content, and then some uh, other optional services. And then we also defined the services that are, uh, were required for, to implement the EDUTDM tool. And um, what uh, we wanted to have is to create uh, the, a core service of the EDUTDM tool that it's going to have all the things that we discussed earlier, such as the validation, the URL uh, redirection and the aggregation, but also some extras which would going to be beneficial for uh, the user the publisher, but also the medium, like the university that would sit in the middle. And uh, this would be, for example, the casting, so that uh, it would not produce a lot of traffic to the, uh, the university's um, and publisher's uh, loads, or uh, the searching of the aggregated content, or uh, how this uh, usage could be monitored either by the publisher or by the um, institution that sits in the middle, which is the university. Um, and then we created also a table where we tried to identify the other uh, most important uh, organizations or publishers uh, that uh, provide uh, content uh, for text and data mining. And we tried to make it uh, in a nice visual way, um, uh, give the benefits of uh, the, the UTDM tool. And, um, um, while we were doing this research uh, in an RRI way, we, in the beginning, we were uh, very much frustrated and we were not quite sure whether the things we are doing, we are doing them in an RRI way and we are doing it in a way that it's more inclusive. And uh, we had a lot of challenges, but we also learned a lot of things. Um, the, so one of the challenges that we identified is that uh, researchers must have a very good understanding of uh, the stakeholders that are related to the research question. And it took us a couple of meetings of brainstorming to find out who is going to be affected uh, by this uh, research proposal and who would be interested by in the, by the, from this, in this research proposal. And um, sometimes you just um, realize that uh, it takes a lot of thinking to look around in a spherical view and try to see the all the stakeholders that uh, are being uh, related uh, that are uh, related and then uh, we also wanted to um, see that funding and for following the RRI process is always a challenge because uh, right now this project has stopped because we cannot uh, receive uh, funding and uh, doing it in a RRI way means that it takes more time the one, than the one that we could uh, do if we were not doing it in a RRI way. Um, and then we also found out that uh, we, involving all the stakeholders from the beginning of the process, it was very, very interesting. But then we also realized that at some point, we, because the discussions varied from the first discussion to the last one, that at some points when the discussions were more technical, we would lose the interest of those stakeholders who were not as technical or their role were not uh, so technical. And then we were, when we were talking more about the organizational aspect of it, or like about best practices, then perhaps we would lose other stakeholders 
who either did not have the interest or did not have the capacity to participate into the conversation. Uh, but nonetheless, we were very happy that we did this based on the quadruple helix actors, even though we did not include uh, some uh, of um, uh, their uh, main uh, components and, um, um, and stakeholders. And uh, we wanted to, we are very happy that we did it in the first, uh, for the first time via a project because we did not have the pressure of uh, doing this uh, like in real life, um, actually participating in the, in the RRI component in real life. So now in the future, we would be able to perform uh, in a RRI way a project because we have learned all this knowledge from uh, this uh, Fit for RRI uh, project, which was, um, whose aim was to teach us how to do this in a RRI way. And uh, there were uh, some surprises, for example. Uh, in the beginning, we thought that uh, we should not uh, involve too many publishers. And then it turned out that uh, some publishers found out about what we were doing from a uh, word of mouth. So they contacted us and they asked to be involved into these conversations. So this was very surprising for us. And uh, then uh, there were also others who were interested about the experiment and uh, about the aims of the experiment. Uh, for example, uh, someone from um, um, the, within the, the Open University found out about what we are doing and uh, they, were, they contacted us again to find out more information about this. So those are uh, very good things on promoting uh, the project, but also on the impact that this may have, perspective in impact that a project may have on uh, others who may not uh, be very much uh, familiar with uh, what we are doing. And at the same time as a researcher, we did not think that they would be interested in what we are doing. So this is everything from me, and I hope that I did not take a, a lot of uh, your uh, thank you very time. Much. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy. This was really, really excellent, very detailed. And thank you also, you did uh, part of my job because you summed up some of the key points that I wanted to say. And thank you very much for that. Excellent. We can proceed directly to the questions, also due in light with the time constraints. I already received some questions, but in the meantime, please feel free to raise hands, you know, write a note or do something, let us know if you want to ask questions. I'll just proceed to um, some of the questions that I already received in uh, private messages from you, from the audience. Uh, there's a question actually for, uh, for all experiments. Uh, was there any, any clear mindset change towards RRI in, in terms of uh, adopting RRI inside the organization? Any Anyone who wants to answer from the experiment? Okay. Andrea? Yeah. Well, clear mindset, I would say that is exaggerated. <laughs> for sure, there is a new sensitivity for the topic, and it is entering in our overall agenda of the institution. So we are start thinking about responsibility and openness. We approved policies on this, so there is improving attention. Now we really need a general cultural jump. Probably this happened in some, just some part of the organization, but not in the entire organization. Thank you very much. Nancy, in your case? As I said earlier, our project was not so much to change people's mindsets within the organization, within the institution, but we also realized while we were having the discussions with the variety of stakeholders, that concepts that were presented from one point of view, let's say the publishers, were not concepts that were thought from another point of view, let's say the text and data miners, or those who promote best practices, and um, especially with regards to openness and using open tools. Excellent. So in our group, this has happened, but not at an institutional change. Yeah, and it's actually very interesting to notice this, and it's a very good case study, and it was actually on purpose that we had in the consortium and as part of the experiment, the Open University, because it is a completely decentralized organization as, com as compared to the traditional higher education institutions of in Europe. 
and this showed actually how RRI can be embedded in these uh, two alternative types of uh, institutions. Thank you very much. Raquel, if you're online, mindset change? Uh, well, well I, as, I, as I said before, I think it's more like we planted the seed, the seed. and uh, yes, I think in, in time things will start, to, at least the seed is there and people are starting to think about it. So I think it's not clear, but uh, <laughs> it takes time to see the, the change, yes. Thank you very much. And the second question that I received uh, as a private message from the audience relates to uh, involvement of society. Did it work or why it didn't work? Andrea, you can start again if you want. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, yeah, it worked. I mean, that's probably, even though I say that we are a little bit reluctant to cross fertilization, I understand that there is a, uh, well, a mutual need of cooperating with civil society and also the society is asking for reference point to, to cooperate with academia. So I think that this is like, as Raquel said, in terms of mindset, it's an interesting seed that we've planted and we're working on that. Thank you very much. Uh, well, in the case of Nancy, of course, it's a different situation, so it did not apply that much. Uh, Raquel? Well, in our case, as I said also during our presentation, that was the part that uh, was a little bit skipped. Uh, because of our activity, we work a lot of uh, public authorities and we work a lot with the industry, which are our main uh, goal, uh, clients and uh, partners. Uh, and we, but at least we know that, uh, yes, engaging with the public, public engagement is, is something that we really need to improve. And there are plans for that already. So, yes, I think it's a matter of time. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions that someone wants to ask live besides the written ones? I, I just want to add something maybe. Yes, but at least in our case, uh, it's, it's noticeable that uh, researchers are quite resistant to involving the public in uh, the research. So yes, that's also something that we need to work on uh, with the, the researchers it's they, themselves. Excellent. Okay, if there are no further questions, I would like to thank you very much for joining specifically this parallel session. It was a very engaging and uh, actually applied discussion and hopefully you got the answers that you were looking for, everyone that attended. And for us, it was a very good learning experience as always. Uh, we can close the session now and uh, as a reminder in 12 minutes the last session of today's uh, strand of fit for ri will start please connect using the appropriate link it, it is going to be fully interactive and uh, it is actually going to capitalize on everything that uh, happened until now during this conference so thank you very much bye bye thank you bye